Welcome to the Lorns of History, a podcast about connecting history to current events. My name is Jay, and I'm joined, as always, by my ruggedly handsome co-host, Colin. And this week, we're continuing our series on history of capitalism and socialism here in the United States. Last week, we talked about the Great Depression, and this week, we're going to be talking about the aftermath or the recovery of the Great Depression, what worked, what didn't work, some common misconceptions, and what actually did get us out of the Great Depression. So, Colin, what are what are our key takeaways for, for this episode? Thanks, Jay. And it was really hard to narrow it down to three. And some of these are somewhat controversial in the fact that not everyone, there's not a consensus on all of them, but um, the three that I think we want to take away from today's episode are the New Deal didn't actually end the Depression. I'm going to contend that World War II didn't actually end the Depression either. Um, And then finally, FDR's New Deal was actually bad long-term for freedom. And that really gets into the Economic Bill of Rights that he was um, planning on uh, implementing after World War II. So those are basically the three takeaways. Let's take a quick recap of last week's episode. So in last week's episode, we talked about the two leading theories behind the stock market crash of 1929 and how that led to the Great Depression. And this week, we're going to pick up with the election and inauguration of Franklin Delano Roosevelt, FDR, the longest serving president in the United States history. So prior to Franklin Delano Roosevelt becoming president of the US, Herbert Hoover had um, tried and failed to kickstart the US economy. He raised taxes to try and generate more revenue and had even passed the Smoot-Hawley Act, which increased tariffs um, and ultimately had a negative effect on the economy. He was also perceived as someone who was part of the problem and, you know, for lack of a better term, out of touch. Um, There was what was called the Bonus Army, which marched on Washington, D.C., which were World War I veterans um, who wanted to be paid their due pension instead of actually going out and addressing the protesters who were all World War I veterans, uh, Herbert Hoover stuck the cavalry on him and led by a general, the future General MacArthur, basically went through and burned down their tents and their small shanties that they had built in DC. That's really not a good luck if you're the president to go through and uh, chase off veterans with the US military. It's just not a good look. And so much to the point that FDR, by contrast, when protesters marched on DC again, when he had first become president, he sat down and had coffee with them. So the whole perception of FDR was someone who was was there and empathetic, and he was going to be the guide for the American economy. He was going to get us out of this mess. Everything from his fireside chats to his New Deal, and the New Deal is really what I want to focus on right now. So, the if we want to think about the New Deal, FDR was proposing this New Deal. It was we think of it with three R's, and so there's a thing a New Deal, and then three R's. So there's the ref, uh, recovery or relief, recovery, and reform. And so when we talk about the relief part of it, unemployment was about 25%. Most people were having homes foreclosed and they were kicked off their farms and became tenant farmers, basically sharecroppers again. The question he wanted to answer was, how can we improve the plight of the average American? So there's organizations like the uh, the CCC, um, which is uh, basically young people preserving natural resources, going to work on natural parks. Uh, there was the CWA, the Federal, uh, Federal Emergency Relief Act as well, that basically came in and would provide a temporary job or um, relief money that you would need so that you didn't go hungry, so that you had a job, so that you could be put to work and provide some good back to society. And those were very short term. Um, Then you had the recovery side, which was like, okay, how can we move the nation forward? How can we rebuild this economy? This is extremely Keynesian type of economic theory here, but they believe that utilizing government spending on these large programs um, like the WPA, the TVA, um, FHA could all help the US economy recover. So the TVA was Tennessee Valley Authority. Uh, Just as an example, that was the government basically creating its own utility company that they would build these massive hydroelectric dams, try and generate electricity uh, for the rural South. It's very interesting because this was not something that the U.S. had ever really experimented with, where the government would now be in direct competition with private enterprises. You know, there was a net benefit in that they provided a lot of 
infrastructure for the American economy and a lot of jobs. And then there's things like the FHA, which is still around today. So basically providing people the ability to gain a home at a fair loan, fair interest rates so that they could purchase a home. If you think about it, one of the best ways to join or one of, really the best way to join the middle class is home ownership. So the idea was that we could help the American people gain home ownership and that will be a way to generate wealth and prosperity. And then on the reform side, uh, this is where the question of how do we prevent this from ever happening again was answered. So, you know, the FDIC and the SEC were formed and what these were, the FDIC was basically the government coming in saying, okay, these banks cannot operate by fly-by-night rules. They have to have some sort of federally, federal rules and regulations that they have to abide by so that they don't run out of money again. Last week, we talked about the um, the bank holiday, which allowed banks to uh, rebuild some of their cash reserves. Well, the FDIC was going to say, set minimum standards so that you had to have a certain amount of money on hand uh, in order to provide additional loans and investment. And the SEC was basically an organization that would come in and investigate unfair trade practices. So both of those are still around today. So that's not all of the alphabet agencies, but that's a lot of them. And that's kind of a summary of what the thought process was, was we are going to invest, we get have a massive government investment in the US economy, and that is going to kickstart us out of this great depression. It's interesting that Americans, generally speaking, look back on these on this New Deal, right? These three R's favorably. We we think like, oh, this was this was great. These programs really work. And what's what's interesting in in you know, Colin, I'm sure you'll get into this in a second. They didn't like work that much. <laughs> well, it, so the part of the initial favorability of this was, like I said. FDR was seen as somebody who cared. He had fireside chats. He was there with us in the Great Depression. He is doing this for us. It, it's a radical new way of government intervention. And this has never been done at this scale before. So prior to the Great Depression and FDR, the government was not at nearly as involved as it is today. So this this moment in history is pivotal because now the government was directly involved with your well-being. They had a vested interest with these agencies and FDR to say, okay, the average man, the average woman deserves this job. We are going to provide this minimum standard of living through jobs, through um, relief, through food, through all of these um, different government mandates for quotas. And we'll get into quotas and the effect that had. So there's food quotas, agricultural quotas, production quotas, things like that, price controls. The government was going to have a heavy hand in that. That had never been done before. So by and large, and we saw that in the Gilded Age where there was no government intervention and private enterprise went wild. Now the government is the monopoly acting. Um, but people had this kind of emotional response like, well, you know what? FDR wants to get us back to work. I'm out of work and I've been out of work for a year. I can't afford my mortgage or to buy food for my family. I can go work. You know, this WPA, the TVA, I can go work. They're giving me some kind of a job and we're building a new road. So there was a an emotional response to that. And I think that's why a lot of folks, especially around this time, looked on it favorably, at least initially. Yeah. And, and to be honest, and to clarify why I'm saying it didn't work, in a nutshell, the reason why the Great Depression was so bad was that so many businesses had to close their doors. Like when... In 1933, when unemployment reached about 25%, it it wasn't because these people all of a sudden became unqualified for their jobs. It was because their business shut down. The business didn't exist, right? So when FDR created or, or, and the government created all these new work programs, yes, it gave people a job, but... The economy is not stimulated by simply having a job. The economy is stimulated by profit, right? And the government isn't making a profit. <laughs> so, like, FDR didn't create all these businesses. He, the government, became the business. And a business that doesn't make profit, by the way. And so, it's like, yeah, these people had a job, but, like, the... 
it was it was putting Tylenol when you have cancer. Like get you gotta fix the cancer was the fact that small that private businesses literally went up in smoke. The government band-aid was, well, we'll give you a job. And it's like, yeah, but that doesn't actually fix the problem. We need businesses, not government employment. So it, like I said, it's interesting that you say that because FDR's government was now trying to artificially control supply and demand. They were supposed to, they were trying to control the supply and control the demand. And they don't make a profit. And that profit com- the, the idea that profit is what stimulates the economy. Well, businesses need profit in order to reinvest that, you know, we've heard it, it, it's much maligned today, but you hear like trickle down economics and things like that. But that actually, if you're in the business world, that's actually how a company makes money and a company makes money, then it grows and it's able to employ more people. Those people are then are able to turn around and buy thing additional um, goods and services from other business. And it has this ripple effect. Well, during the Great Depression, you had to pay for this somehow, uh, and that somehow was generally through higher taxes. So the tax rate increased dramatically during the Great Depression, and it wasn't just the t- you know an income tax. Um, the income tax did hit, I think, in the the 30s, as high as 79 percent for the top bracket. So you think about it: your top earners, which was an incredibly small amount of people. Um, was about 79% of your income taken away from federal income taxes. There's also taxes on dividends, which basically the profit that a business would make, you would have to pay higher rates of taxes. So why is, as a business owner, if I'm going to pay more, would I make more? So they the I, this artificial production was stifled because the government was stifling business by taking away any incentive they had to make more. And the real driver behind an, any economy is it's in, it's enterprise, free enterprise. We've already been over that. So this is where you start to see the socialist versus the capitalist um, conflict during the 30s in that, yes, the government came in, they gave a bunch of people jobs, they built a lot of infrastructure, and it was wildly popular for a time because people initially thought, I'm back to work and we're building things. We can kind of see it. But um, like any monopoly, there is going to be corruption. Sorry, just to recall our listeners back to the history of socialism and capitalism here, the FDR's new deal, so FDR's new deal was a I hesitate to say that it was socialist because FDR was not a Marxist following socialist. He still right? allowed private property. Right. However, one of the main presuppositions behind socialism is instead of private enterprise, you have collective enterprise. Well, in a democratic society, what collective enterprise looks like is the government employing people through government sponsored activities like do do we see here how okay it's it's misleading to try to label the new deal as the socialist program but it's essentially the same thing (laughs) like you hearken back to what we talked about in in one of the first episodes with rousseau and the socialist con or the social contract where in order to maximize the good for an individual, they have to submit their their own individual interest to the collective. And the collective will then decide what is good. And that, quote, maximizes the freedom and the good for everyone. Well, that is basically what FDR was doing. He was saying, okay, we are the collective as the government. And being the experts that we are, we are going to decide how the collective is going to operate. Um, and now we have an interest in what the collective does. So we're going to decide you as an, and it took away the individuals because you don't have um, the uh, discretionary or what is it? Uh, you don't have extra income to spend on goods that you want to buy because there are no goods because the government has set production limits, quotas. Um, they have price controls that they're, because they are controlling supply and demand, you can't always get what you want and you don't have the uh, money to do so, the extra income to do so. You have a job, but then you're taxed at a high rate so that they can go and employ you some more. Uh, and what you want to buy isn't available. So you're right. It's not the most efficient way to get uh, to 
optimize an economy. Yeah, and this is this is fundamentally the the problem with socialism is that it removes individual control over their own ac- economic activity and you just by default get a particular group of people who who are probably the most well-intentioned people in the world, right? It, you get this limited group of people and they get all the decision-making authority to determine the nature, the scope, the the rules for all economic t- economic activity for those below them and like it is blatantly obvious that this system stifles economic activity because these this this few people uh, in 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 FDR's instance the new deal right these few people they can't possibly control um enable economic activity in the same way that you know thousands upon hundreds of thousands of people could do for themselves so so it's odd that in in after the great depression or after the stock market crash and the runs on the banks that we would go oh in order to fix the problem we're actually going to stifle the problem or stifle the solution here <laughs> so not only is it less efficient and stifling there's also a lot of negative impacts that it can have so and i'm actually and this is not a uh like, hey, we're only going to pull from kind of what we would consider right-wing sources. If you go read Howard Zinn's A People's History of the United States, um, Howard Zinn is an avowed leftist, um, probably a borderline communist, and he was even critical of a lot of these programs. For example, the the AAA, the um, Agricultural Adjustment Administration, um, had extremely negative effects. So we think is these good socialists, we are going to elevate the low class, the working man, the means of production, you know, those, those laborers. Well, this AAA agency, well, they want, they set controls, they set price controls and they set quotas on how much food can be produced because they said, well, we've got to fix this price. So we're going to go back and we're going to say, you can't produce any more. And I think actually at one point there was like 6 million pigs that they just killed outright that never hit the market. They said, this kid, these can't go to the market and they just killed them. Well, the unintended consequences were that the poorest farmers, so African-American farmers and poor white farmers in the South were what they were called tenant farmers or basically sharecroppers where they rented a farm to work were hurt the most and they were displaced and they ended up in bread lines and cities. Um, because they were not able to make any money. So the people who, what we were trying to help the most were actually hurt the most because they couldn't compete. They couldn't make any money and they couldn't make any profits. So they ended up getting kicked off their farms and then they were in a bread line and now they were forced into this cycle of, well, now we rely on the government. We've got to vote for the government in order to feed ourselves. So it created a vicious cycle. And even Howard Zinn is, is critical of that. He's like, the people you wanted to help the most, you hurt, you hurt the most. Um, whatever your intentions were, this is the outcome. And so you can't think of the, you know, part of this uh, romantic romanticized view of the new deal is like, well, they intended it to be so great and they intended it for everyone to be okay. Well, it doesn't matter because long-term it really didn't change anything. And so I'm going to read a quote from um, Henry Morgenthau, who was the secretary of the treasury in 1939. We are spending more than we ever have spent before. And it does not work. I say after eight years of the administration of this administration, we have just as much unemployment as when we started and an enormous debt to boot. And he said that he exclaimed that. And to be fair, employment was down from like 25% to 15%, but it never got it never got lower than that and that's still very high and that's after years of these programs. Oh, and by the way, a lot of these programs were extremely corrupt. So if we look back at some of the um, biggest critiques and the criticism and the hatred that was um brought out and aimed at these robber barons, these captains of industry in the Gilded Age was that, well, they're doing these unscrupulous business tactics. They're they're squashing competition. They're using um, 
corporate espionage. They're, you know, they're basically running people into the ground and people didn't like those business practices. Well, the government was not above that. And I hate to break it to you, but the government was just a different, a, another monopoly. FDR and John Rockefeller were basically the same person. They owned a monopoly and they did whatever they could to get um, their agenda done. And so here's an example of this in, you know, in the thirties, it's, I don't have the exact statistics, but you can take a look at it around election time. You can look at the graphs and unemployment, especially in key states like Florida and Ohio, uh, unemployment would suddenly dip because all the money was diverted to employing people in those states just before midterms and election years. So that they, because as soon as those people were given a job and given some money, they knew that they had secured their votes. Um, and so a lot of these organizations, the money became politicized and it became basically a spoils of patronage system through government money. And it was your money that they were do- they were doling out and providing favors for. So to say that, well, the government had everyone's best interests at heart, maybe initially and maybe at the very top. But in practice, we start to see that they were doing the exact same thing. They were doling out money based on favors and it was timed very well so that it would have the intended political effect. Yeah. Sounds familiar. <laughs> yeah. It's weird. It's almost like it continues to happen. It's almost like this. Yeah. It's almost like it always happens. Yeah. It, 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 I just think that's a, it's an important observation to make for people that FDR was not like this. He was perceived to the average man at the time as this lovable grandfather character. He was just, just wheeling around with his blanket in a wheelchair and, and talking to us by the fire. But Um, He was born to be a politician. Um, Like I think he threatened the Supreme, the Supreme. So a lot of these, um, these acts that were passed, like the glass Steagall act that formed a lot of these alphabet agencies um, came under scrutiny and were um, challenged in the Supreme court. Well, FDR was just like, well, I'll just pack the courts. I'll just, I'll change the rules so that they have to retire at 70 if they don't do what I want. And I'll just replace them with somebody that I want there. It's like, okay, well, and and that's another thing. The term packing the court does not mean I'm going to legally appoint somebody who I would, is going to interpret the constitution the way I think that they should. Um, It is, I'm just going to add people. Okay. Well, there's, there's five, there's nine. I'm just going to add another one. I'm going to, I'll add 10 and they'll all be, they'll all line up to me. That's what packing the court really means. And it originates with F, you know, FDR or he, uh, made it famous where he's like, I'll just pack the courts. And then the Supreme Court started doing what they started playing ball. I just want to dispel that notion that he was like this lovable person all the time. Like he was, he was born to be a politician. He was a politician at heart. He was basically John Rockefeller just in the public, the public arena versus private yeah. enterprise. So Colin, just to move us along to World War II, uh, because a lot of people, including myself, <laughs> <laughs> think that if uh, FDR's New Deal didn't actually get us out of the Great Depression, it was World War II. So so tell us, Colin, why is that the case or not the case? <laughs> well, that's a good point. Yeah, I think we can look back on the, the, the Depression era, the New Deal, and see that by and large, it didn't work. It didn't have the intended effect. World War II, as a lot of economists state, was what brought us out it because our production levels you know in wartime production was unmatched federal spending increased like 10 times and 40 percent of the workforce was supporting the war so you know in 39 i think unemployment was around 15 percent during the war it reached like two percent it, it's just unprecedented level levels of unemployment everybody was supporting the war so everybody was getting paid by the government in deficit spending to support the war so people did have some money and they were put to work to produce something I am going to contend that World War II was only a continuation, basically, of this government spending of the New Deal era, and it was not going to have a long-term um, recovery. You know, it wasn't going to contribute to the long-term recovery. As a matter of fact, at the time, a lot of politicians and economists thought that as soon as the war ended, they were just going to go right back into an economic contraction um, and be right back where they started from. And I'm not, I'm not. John Maynard Keynes or Milton Friedman with my level of economic knowledge. But I think it's pretty plain to see that during World War II, 
we had a goal and a mission and a reason to be producing that much. What happens to that level of production and late workforce participation when the war ends? When you bring back 12 million American uh, GIs back to the workforce, well, suddenly, where are they going to go work? Somebody's going to be out of work. During World War II, uh, women had entered the workforce at an even more unprecedented level. So now you're going to have millions more of American GIs coming back. Where are they going to work? What are they going to produce? Now that we're not producing... um, you know, a B-29 bomber or a B-24 bomber a day, um, what are they going to work on to produce? There are still things that we are spending on in Europe and the Cold War with the Marshall Plan. And so there's still government spending required, but where did that come from? And as a matter of fact, taxes during World War II were astronomical. The I think the corporate tax was around 90% and the top the top layer of the, of the income tax bracket was like 94%. If you came back and you started earning money at those tax rates, again, the the incentive to invest that money back in the economy would have just not been there. So during World War II, um, because unemployment was so low, a lot of these alphabet agencies of the New Deal just went away, like the WPA, the, the AAA, all of these, they just went away because they weren't needed. Um, there was nobody to work them. And um, so those went away. So World War II ends, the federal the bal- the federal government had to start balancing its budget again. They cut these tax rates. And so once these tax rates started being cut, people wanted to invest their money. And so this is what Senator Robert Taft said the, um, at the end of World War II. The problem is now to get is to get production and employment. If we can get production, prices will come down by themselves to the lowest point justified by increased costs. If we hold prices at a point where no one can make profit, there will be no expansion of existing industry and no new industry in the field. So I would contend that the fact that we lowered taxes and reduced federal spending and federal programs and put people back to work in a natural economic state. So they had all this money that they had saved during World War II. They had a reason to spend it. So they started spending money, demand increased for these goods. So companies had to start investing to produce it. And it just created this feedback loop of economic growth. I don't disagree with what we did in 1945 and beyond kept us from going back into a contraction. However, I I go back to why I say the New Deal didn't really work and help anything. And that's because private businesses weren't coming back prior to World War II. However, during World War II, the private businesses came back. Like Like Boeing, for example, there was not a demand to make B-29s in 1935, right? But there was a demand in 1940 uh, to start doing that uh, when Lin Lee started. And all of a sudden, this business shows up. It's like, oh, we can start making these ginormous freaking airplanes. And then after World War II, the tax cuts and everything that you're saying, that allowed them to stay in business. But what created that initial demand was the war itself. Right. I mean, I'm not going to disagree with you that World War II was it was an economic stimulus. Like, you, you know, that's a very cold and callous way to look at such a, a loss of life. But it really was an economic stimulus. But the fact that we had it was a temporary means. So, yes, Boeing builds B-29s. Well, when you come back, it's like, well, the war is still going on. Now we don't have B-29s to make. What is the government going to continue to spend this money to keep us in business to build B-29s that nobody wants? It's like, well, no, now we're going to pivot to commercial airlines because now people have a little bit of money thanks to those mm-hmm. lower taxes and that they've saved. And now they there is a demand for air travel because we can. People are willing to pay money that they now have in order to do it. So yeah, it was a stimulus. It was a shot to the arm, but it was not like the long-term solution. And I think it was those tax breaks at the end that kept us from going back into this cycle of contraction and deep government investment. Because then, Mm -hmm. and it's interesting to take a look at during the New Deal era, the Democratic Party, and if you remember back to our history of the political parties, the Democratic Party at this point kind of changed the co- the coalition and who who made it up it became very urban um, it became a party you know African Americans went from 
Republican Party to Democratic Party, a lot of that happened here. The South, which was heavily Democrat, actually started to ally with these urbanites, um, African Americans, universities, and a lot of young people tended to be more uh, democratic at this point. It all happened in the 40s. At the end of World War II, there was this alliance between uh, Dem- Southern Democrats and Republicans basically to say like, okay, we are not going to continue these New Deal policies. And so in 1944, with all of these programs closing, FDR recognizing that the war was going to end soon, he was like, well, what do we need to do next? And he had what was called the Economic Bill of Rights basically taking the new deal a step further. So, you know, our bill of rights, and we talk about this in some of our, the history, the, when we talk about the constitution and things like that are, it's a natural law. It's given to us by a, a higher power, if you will. So they are inalienable rights and the government's role is to protect those, not to provide them with this economic uh, bill of rights. The government basically said, we're going to guarantee you a standard of living and a job and an income that we will determine what it is. And we are going to provide all your needs through this economic bill mm. of rights. And the government was now the source of these rights. So a lot this kind of this coalition between Southern Democrats and Republicans were like, no way. We're going to not allow that. So when FDR died, and by the way, the New Deal was already starting to get more and more unpopular and people were starting to kind of pick up on it and lost interest. And I think that's probably part of why FDR recognized that he needed to do something drastic. But when he died, Truman took over and Truman was a very bright man, but he did not have the charisma or the popularity of FDR. Um, so with this economic bill of rights and a lot of these acts that he was going to try and pass, these Southern Democrats and Republicans, just because they had gained more seats in the House and the Senate, were able to either make them completely toothless or just altogether kill them. So he was unable to enact this economic bill of rights, which would have had a dramatic effect on our individual rights as Americans. But that's really what allowed some of these tax cuts because they were at 94, you know, the upper, the upper tier of the upper tax bracket, 94%. It started slowly coming down after World War II. And that's where we start to see some of this investment. And it's part of this, it's because of this coalition that was um, really fighting against government overreach. There's also other things going on too. Like we, I think you barely, or you mentioned the, the Marshall plan uh, where from a, from a monetary standpoint, like the the government was giving loans out to foreign countries, there was also what we see is the birth of the military industrial industrial complex as well that Eisenhower later criticized, uh, and part of that is the these businesses, right? The demand that they were created to meet was war, and it's difficult to adapt. You know, if your job is to make machine guns, it's difficult to adapt that to other things. Um, so they wanted to create, continue this demand for machine guns. And and we see in the 50s, right? Like all of a sudden, the US military, like, yes, it shrunk considerably after World War II, but there was never going back to the interwar years of... Um, you know, a super small military fighting in the banana wars and things like that. It's just, yeah, you're right. It, I, I should say that too. It's not, when I say that we, the demand was not there after World War II, it was substantially smaller, but it was still there. You're right. We still had an enemy in the Cold War and we were, you know, for all intents and purposes, fighting that war in other places, you know, within Korea, mm-hmm. and later Vietnam and and the space race was basically an extension of that. So there's still a need for government spending. And we, you're right, we never went back to what we were spending in like the 1800s for the federal government. We never went back to that and we probably never will now. But it was just so much, it was such a smaller chunk of the investment in the American economy that I think it was really the fact that we got into this feedback loop of people having more money, spending more money, increasing demand, and they had to you know, the supply had to meet that demand. So that's where I think the recovery really occurred. And, you know, that became like a a golden age of American economic, of the American economy from the 50s, 60s. And I think it ended technically um, during the recession of the 1970s. But during this time, like American production and manufacturing had already reached unprecedented levels in the 1800s. But now we were like a world power geopolitically and in manufacturing. We produced 
so much, you know, we the goods that we produced, it was unbelievable. And now that people were back and they had some of that money, they wanted to spend it. And so this, mm-hmm. you know, we had already seen a rise of consumerism um, in the late 1800s because goods were becoming cheaper with the Industrial Revolution. Well, now it's like, well, we just fought World War II. Uh, there's this threat of existential human extinction with the with uh, the the Cold War. We want to spend the money because these goods are available. We have the money, so. You think about the the quintessential American dream, like, well, I want 2.4 kids. I want a white picket fence, a car, a TV now, like that. Mm. That began now and because it was readily available and people started spending money chasing that um, that American dream. And it's actually kind of interesting. I take a look at that in my own opinion. It's kind of where we really started uh, attributing like freedom with capitalism and freedom of like our political rights. Well, if it's if you're a capitalist, you're for freedom. It's like, y- yeah. yes and no. Like, I think you're kind of conflating the two, but I think that's where we have this vision. We look back to the 50s with kind of rose colored glasses and see the economy of the 50s, 60s, and early 70s and say, well, everything was so great then because of uh, American spending. Mm-hmm. And uh, not to get too far into our next episode, but a lot of the main problems with capitalism that was driving workers towards socialism uh, prior to World War One. a lot of that had been addressed, not fixed, but had been addressed somewhat. You know, child labor laws were in, in effect. Uh, there were, you know, minimum wage had already been legislated uh, in, in certain areas. The, you know, working conditions improved drastically. So now these same businesses that were popping up during World War II and after World War II, it wasn't that bad to be a worker. So you could be, you know, you could, the father of the home could have a, have a job working, you know, eight eight to five and would make enough money to to feed his, you know, wife and X number of kids. And that was, and that was normal. Secondly, uh, sorry, I say all that to say the one of the main drivers for people going to socialism had been kind of had the rug pulled out from underneath it. Secondly, we see you know the Red Scare starts coming into effect. Russia becomes this big boogeyman. The commies uh, were were a big threat, and everyone knows like that that was inextricably linked with socialism and communism. The only good communist is a dead communist. <laughs> <laughs> right. So we start seeing, uh, you know, there's this, the Chinese Civil War that picked up after World War II again. Um, like, it's not a good time to be a socialist during World War II uh, and after World War II from the American perspective. I think it's a little bit more nuanced when it when you look at it from like a European perspective. But from a, from as an American, it's no longer cool to be a socialist uh, for, for several decades now. It's kind of interesting, like how quickly that shift was because in the thirties you had people like the Kingfish, Huey Long, which gosh, he is, he, I, I wish I could have talked more about him on this episode. Cause he is a fascinating individual. I mean, he, he met one of his, uh, his political opponents one time in a hotel, like outside of an elevator, and they got in an argument. And he punched him in the face. I mean, he was just wild, wildly popular, but he was even more radical than FDR, and he had a following that was fanatical. I mean, he, I think his bodyguards were called the the uh, the Cossacks, skull crushers, basically, and you know, people loved him. I think he won ninety seven percent of the vote in Louisiana at one point. Like he was unbelievably that, popular. That doesn't sound corrupt at all. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, uh, election. As a matter of fact, as a matter of fact, we talk so about- say, If you win over, if you win north of 90% of a vote, like, I'm sorry, there's got to be corruption there. Well, so <laughs> when he was, he was actually impeached as governor of Louisiana. Well, so mind you, at this point, Louisiana was extremely democratic, deep south, plus the, you know, he's promising to put people back to work in the depression era. But when he was impeached, um, there was controversy over the electric voting system that occurred um, in the state house in Louisiana, and there was mm. accusations of um, election tampering. So the idea that uh, you know stop the stop the vote and yeah, fa- it's not like this is new. Like what happened in twenty twenty yeah. has happened many times before. 
I that's one thing I love about the loins of history. Like I feel like one of our taglines should be nothing is new. It's happened once, it's gonna happen again. <laughs> there's there's nothing new under the sun. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. And, and I don't mean to get off on a tangent about Huey Long, but the point is he, you know, said it wasn't cool to be a socialist or a communist in the 50s. Well, like during the 30s, it was like people were fanatical about Huey Long. And, you know, he was unfortunately assassinated um, by a political opponent under very questionable circumstances, but like he was radically left. And it wasn't like, you know, he was very pro workers' rights. I mean, he was like, give everybody free books, free everything. Like he was trying to take down, st- na- like basically nationalize oil and everything. So he was. A radical leftist and pro workers' rights. And like within that fanaticism, within like 20 years, just disappeared, evaporated. Um, and, you know, I do want to say this as well. Not, we were critical of the New Deal in this episode, but it's not like the, everything in the New Deal was bad or didn't work. I mean, people now probably have, most people now have probably gotten an FHA loan. <laughs> um, it's a very good loan, it's great for first time home ownership. The FDIC putting in rules. Now, there's some debate on whether or not that like it discouraged investment from banks and to diversify their portfolios. But like having a set of rules that they have to abide by isn't a bad thing. And having a security exchange commission monitoring like unfair business practices, it's not a bad thing. Like those, those, I would say those are good things. Those are good checks and balances to prevent something from getting out of control like it hap- like what happened in the 20s. So not everything during the 30s in the New Deal was bad. I think we just need to temper our view of the New Deal and how effective it really was. And then, oh, by the way, remember that probably long-term, it had a negative effect on our, our freedom. Um, in Milton Friedman's book, Capitalism uh, and Freedom, which was the book recommendation of the week, Um, He makes the argument for like social security and basically says like the government has a monopoly on there and it's not freedom because I don't have a choice not to participate. He's basically saying like I am forced to give money to this and I I don't have an option. If I had other options, maybe, um, but no matter what, my pay, a portion of my paycheck is taken and given to this and I have no control of how it's invested. I have no control over who does what with this money. I'm just forced to do it. He's like, that's not really freedom. He's like, freedom would be to say, hey, I have this option. I can give it. I have a number of choices that I can do. We don't have that. So anytime there's a government agency being formed, I think we need to take a look and say like, well, how is this going to affect my ability to choose and make choices? And how is it overall going to affect my my freedom? Yeah. I'm pro-economic choice. <laughs> It's a very good way to put it. It, it, Exactly. It's the, I mean, that's one of the biggest things he contends is that the more options you have, the more free you are. And in an economy, the idea that the government has, the government is basically a monopoly and the more control we give it, um, setting prices, quotas, trying to artificially control supply and demand, the less free you are going to end up being. And it's actually not going to be without A, corruption, and then B, its own failures and stagnation. Yeah. It's interesting. The I was listening to you talk. I was thinking about the definition of power, right? And we give the government power to do certain things. A lot of people just assume that power is the ability to force you to do something or not to do something. And what I would just like our listeners to consider, that's not actually a good definition of power. Rather, a better definition of power is the ability to constrain one's choices, i.e., if you can limit options, you are exerting power over someone. You don't have to force them to do certain things, but if you can only give them one viable options... Did you force them, if that makes any sense? So, i.e., when when we allow the government to remove options from us, the we are uh, we are giving the government power to constrain our freedom. And I'm sorry, but that does not sit well with me. <laughs> and I'm not sure how many of our listeners it sits well with as a as a freedom loving American. <laughs> I mean, that's a good point. I mean, FDR was elected four times. Obviously, there was a, a choice in the election. 
But if you think about it, the choice of I'm giving you this job, you have this job because of me, there's no other jobs out there. And I've made, I've made sure that there's no other jobs. So if you want to eat and make money, you have to continue to vote for me in order to justify the existence of this program. That's not really freedom. And that's, that's, and it's a good thing. I think we, for the most part, corralled that during World War II and immediately after World War II. But it's not like once you, and to your point, once you consent to that and give that power over, it's extremely difficult to get it back if you can get get mm-hmm. all of it back. Like you can't just- Here, here's, here, Sorry to interrupt. Here's no, no, one example. I challenge our listeners, try to not pay your social security and see what happens. One, I don't even know if there's a way you can do that because it's automatically deducted from your paycheck. Well, no. Thanks but, to FDR, tax withholding. That's where we get uh, tax withholding. Yeah. So, Yeah. But but functionally, you can't not pay your Social Security. Furthermore, does the government place the same restriction on itself? Or has the government for decades been stealing money or taking money legally, so it's technically not stealing, taking money from our social security to use it for things that have nothing to do with social security? The answer to that question is yes. So do we really think that these government funded programs that like, oh, we're doing it for your benefit and you don't have a choice and you're going to be happy. But if I want to go use that money and go take it for something else, then, oh, then that's what I'm going to do. This is not freedom. This is not okay. (laughs) And they rely upon our ignorance to get away with it. It's amazing that you say that because it reminded me, we had a a question from a listener on the episode we did about property rights. And it was, if I have to pay property taxes, do I really own my property? And the Hmm. idea, and I can't remember how the rest of the question went, but basically it was, well, if property rights, and we made this case that property rights are the foundation for all our other rights, and I do believe nope. that if you don't pay your property taxes, who, they're just going to come and take it away. Do I really own yeah. that piece of property? And I think that's a question everybody should uh, should listen because I don't have a great yeah. answer for that because I don't really yeah, want to try. <laughs> I don't really want to try because I don't want people with guns showing up at my house to take it. Yeah, or the or it would be the FBI now, uh, or the IRS, I guess. Uh, yeah, the would, IRS would come and show up with guns. No comment. Um, yeah, that's that is a great that is that's definitely a great question that we don't uh, have a have a good answer to. The only thing that I can say off the top of my head is that you know taxes taxes are levied just like Social Security through elected representatives, and if you don't vote, then uh, you don't get a say. And furthermore, like we talked about in our um, uh, political theory of the American Revolution episode, that uh, consent of the govern is a constant and continuous process, and it is not something that occurs, you know, only during an election. So, as we've said multiple times, you know, petition your representatives, give them a call. They do pay attention. Um, every experience I've ever had in contacting my elected representative, they have, regardless of political party, by the way, uh, I've seen both Democrats and Republicans do this. They. They will do what they can. The if there's, you know, if it's this impossible task, then they will try to give the appearance of doing everything that they can. <laughs> but I promise you, like they they care and they will do everything that's in their power to try to, you know, a, a single a single constituent reaching out to their representative is highly influential. It's more influential than what you think. And especially the sure. lower level in government that you go. Like I recommend people go to your go to go to your county meetings, your city meetings. It's amazing. Like if you get up and you're like, I don't agree with this and here's why, they'll be like, Well, I, you know, suddenly eyes are on, you know, your your county council and they're like, Well, okay, I guess we won't do anything. And it's amazing. Uh what things will pass with in the at an eight PM in, in a basement of a of a county um courthouse when nobody's there but as soon as people start showing up it's amazing like a little bit of scrutiny and the, they'll listen and um you know state legislature that's why i think state government is very state and local government is so important because they can affect change and one constituent means a lot more to those people than say like a senator 
you should still call your senators. But um, yeah. anyway, that's, it's the same principle that when Amazon messes up your delivery, you should absolutely call them or through the app or whatever it is that you use for Amazon. You can absolutely tell them, hey, this got messed up. And 99 times out of 100, they will refund your money because they care about the single person's business. Politicians are similar in that it's not that they're making a revenue from you, but they want your vote. So they will do what they can to try to try to change things. It's very true. So anyway, I think All we right. I think we've <laughs> bringing it back. <laughs> yeah, bringing it back. Hey, so just to just to kind of recap, this episode was really kind of finishing the discussion on whether or not the New Deal or World War II or some kind of in-between helped get us out of the Great Depression. And we talked about the implications for how this kind of moves the ball with capitalism and socialism in the United States. So where we're at right now, World War II is over. It's 1945 going into 1950. And we've, we've kind of seen that private business is booming but government spending is also booming and we will we will talk about the trajectory how this kind of goes really up until the 70s and then everything kind of starts going off the rails in the 70s socialism becomes fashionable again socialism becomes fashionable again because there's some major economic problems and lots of uh, lots of random not random but lots of solutions start getting thrown out there so Thank you very much for listening uh, to this episode of The Loins of History. Uh, If you've enjoyed this episode, please give us a five-star review. That is by far the best way to get our message out there. Uh, It tells the Apple and Spotify algorithms um, that you like this episode, and that is by far the the best way to help us out. So please, if you like this episode, give us a five-star review, leave a comment, uh, and give us some feedback. If if it wasn't that great of an episode and you got some constructive criticism, we're open to hear that uh, as well. Uh, if you want to reach out to us any other way, we're on social media. We're on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. You can just search the Loins of History or you can click the link in our show notes. Uh, if you want to support this, if you really like this episode and you want to support us, you can do so by clicking the link for our Patreon page or our Anchor uh uh, subscription. Uh, we definitely appreciate that as well. And thank you to all of our current supporters. You guys are awesome. So uh, thanks for joining us this week. And we look forward to seeing you next week on the loins of history. <laughs>